this is a question of, of how much we want our conscious states and, and emotional life to actually track the reality of our circumstance in the world. And I think we certainly want it to, to, tra to track reality rather closely. Now, the question is whether we want it to perfectly track. That seems to be, I think, open to debate. But clearly, if, you're, if everyone's taking the happiness drug, this is, in, in some basic sense, materially unsustainable. I mean, if you're if you're just knocked out on the couch in bliss, you know, and your children are starving, or you have no career anymore, so there, there are obvious consequences. Well, you slanted that a bit. I mean, it wouldn't have to be. Well, like well that. no, no, no. But so, 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 so the question is, it has to track to some degree. You have, and so then you kind of dial it back from from the oblivion of of. Uh, the, per the, the perfect drug, and you ask yourself, well, just how happy do you want to be able to be? So let's say we have a, let's say we, we develop a pill that is the perfect antidote to grief. So, so somebody dies, and you are inconsolable, let's, let's say your child dies. How, when do you want to take that pill? I mean, do you want to take that pill? What, what, the, what would it mean to take the pill the moment your child dies? Okay, so you've noted your, your, your daughter has drowned in the bathtub. You are come upon the scene, your life is ruined, but then you realize you've got some of these pills in the drawer. So you pop the pill and you don't care. Now, that, that in some sense is, is, is conceivable that that's possible, and that actually could be coming, that kind of development. The question is, uh, what, what are you forsaking? I mean, what does it mean to love someone uh, and to be completely inured to the, their death in the very moment of their death. I mean, this is, so much of what we value in our lives is an actual sensitivity to reality. Now, would you never want to take that pill? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's possible that you know, somebody could just not be grieving so terribly after the death of someone close to them that you would want to take a little bit of the pill. I mean, you want to take an antidepressant, as we as we do now. Um, that seems to me to be perfectly sane. But there's there's this there's this gray area where the question has to gets interesting, and perhaps we'll never feel that we have the, a, a clear cut right answer. But it's clearly not the pill that leaves you just immune to any changes in the world that that are actually relevant to your relationships with those you care about and your understanding of what's going on in the universe. You're facing the classic problems that um, moral philosophers have faced for a long time, and you're well, well aware of them, and you've discussed some of them today, some of them in the book. There's the collie problem, the problem of how you value human happiness against that of other species, which is in your book, but which you, don't, which you haven't referred to tonight. That's another difficult problem. Problems of um, uh, sacrificing some people for the happiness of others. All, all these are difficult problems which have faced moral philosophers for a very long time. But you appear to be bringing to those problems a new thought, which is that science, as opposed to just philosophic thinking, reasoning, uh, could help. Now, moral philosophy is the application of scientific logical reasoning to moral problems. But you are actually, again, you didn't mention it so much in your talk, but in the book, bringing your neurobiological expertise to bear, um, which is a sort of a new way of doing it. Can you t tell me a bit about that? Because um, I, I'm not quite clear how doing neurophysiology kind of adds to uh, insight right. into these moral right. problems. Well, I actually 